Okay, the purpose of this um, hopefully 10 to 15 minute lecture, if I can get it down to that, is to give you guys a very brief overview of the division of Christianity, um, what uh, the denominations um, believe in, kind of, um, what the uh, terms mean and stuff like that. Um, first part you've seen before, I think I even showed it to you before we left school. Um, but this is the first, like, kind of, like, early, like, development of Christianity. It starts with the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Then you've got the missions of Jesus and Paul's disciples. They both add to the teachings. Then you have everybody, remember, who's, like, kind of infighting. And then they all come together and, like, they meet at the Council of Nicaea once, like, you know, um, Constantine has issued the Edict of Milan, which says don't kill Christians. And then you got more teachings like that. And eventually, after what seemed to be, like, seemingly ridiculous things, like the date of Easter or the um, Filioque or stuff, Stuff along those lines. Um, officially in 1054, um, the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches um, split. They'd actually, you know, <clears throat> not really, um, uh, you know, simpatico before that, but the, the official split known as the Great Schism is not until 1054. And you can see looking at this, like, kind of architecture in this a little bit. Um, Catholic architecture is very kind of traditional of what you'd think for most European cathedrals. Um, even Westminster Abbey, which was built on the bottom as like a, like, um, uh, you know, Catholic, although um, now Protestant at this point. Um, this stuff tends to be very ornate. As you can see, um, it tends to um, be very large, Gothic, etc., etc. The opposite is um, is uh, just a, a cultural opposite. It's nothing other than that um, with the Eastern Orthodox churches that generally tend to have the onion gnomes that are also very beautiful and very, very ornate. Your Western cathedrals are usually built more like um, crosses. Your Eastern Orthodox ones are just kind of more squares and then with the domes and stuff like that. But to be honest, um, both um, uh, spent tons and tons of money to make these very, very, very large important churches because in the Middle Ages when this was going on and stuff like that, um, and then even all the way through to the 20th century in most of Europe, this was like seemingly the most important things to the vast majority of people um, and like the Church of the Savior on Spill Blood is literally the most gorgeous church I've ever seen and I've seen quite a lot in Europe um, <clears throat> If you remember, we still have like the leaders of these here, and these are the modern ones. You have Pope Francis I and the Patriarch of Constantinople, Bar Bartholomew I. And if you remember, I'd said um, the difference between um, these is that Fran Francis has pretty much absolute power, or at least like absolute supposed papal authority. Like the Pope can say all sorts of things, like don't use birth control, but people still do it. But either way, if the Pope says it, it's um, it's supposed to be true. Whereas the Patriarch of Constantinople has more like a Confederate um, style authority, if that makes sense. Whereas in the Patriarch um, can suggest kings and say things, but then other churches like within the Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, etc., etc., Serbian Orthodox, they all vote and have their own leaders and their own things with this. And so it really is nowhere near as, um, as powerful and like dominant position as the Pope. And unlike something like the Dalai Lama, the Pope, um, who is seen as the symbol of Christianity, is um, is actually the leader of the largest denomination. There are more Catholics still than there are any group of Christians in the world. There are more Catholics still than there are any other group of Christians in the world. Okay, so back to this. We've got 1054. Okay, we've got the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, and we've got a split right there. Now, if you remember, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages is, like, super, super corrupt, okay? And by the way, we're just going to take the Eastern Orthodox churches. We're going to put them off to the side. Those guys, like, don't really schism much other than this. They pretty much stay the same. They're probably the ones that are closest to the original teachings of the Council of Nicaea and stuff like that. Um, and even Catholics today will admit that they, um, I had one Catholic priest say, well, we like the Eastern Orthodox people a lot more than they like us um, because they tend to see Catholics sometimes as maybe people who, like, got a little corrupt. Speaking of which, and going back to what I was saying, if you remember, the Catholics during the um, Middle Ages were um, very, 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 very corrupt. Um, that was a very famous um, test question for those of you that had me. Um, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages was A, corrupt, B, cor very corrupt, or C, very, very corrupt. Please pick the best answer. And of course, the best answer was C. Um, the height of this corruption was something called the Avignon Schism. I'm not going to go into the details. It involved three popes. It involved the Holy Roman Empire having to depose them and set a new one, etc., etc. Um, but for a while, the Catholic Church is the only game in town, and it stays that way for a while. Okay, I just said that, yeah. But anyway, the Catholic Church is the only game in town. Anyway, it changes thanks to these two people, okay? There had been numerous, numerous amounts of corruption, if you remember, but it really comes to a headway with Pope Leo X, who's on the right. Okay, and Leo X, if you remember, Giovanni di Lorenzo de' Medici is so ridiculously indulgent and corrupt. This is a guy that um, used to serve, like, you know, 
50 plus course meals, having little naked boys jump out of cakes. He painted a boy gold for his coronation, and then that boy died a few days later, or stuff like that. He famously says, the papacy has been given to us, let us enjoy it. Um, that once he ran out of money and ran through the entire papal treasury, um, he started um, the um, sale of indulgences. Now, um, the 1517 indulgence that Martin Luther, the guy on the left, protested against was nothing new. It was really the matter in which they went about it and the ridiculous things they could done and kind of the propaganda around the indulgence. Other indulgences had been done before, but they were nowhere near as ridiculous as Leo's indulgence. Leo's indulgence could forgive almost anything. And then when you were done, you could forgive indulgence for other people. And Martin Luther found that very corrupt. Bam. Schisms the church. So, here we go. 1517. And actually, it's not codified till later, but October 31st, 1517, Luther nails the 95 Theses to the door. Bam. You now have Catholic Church, and you have the Lutheran Church, okay, in Western Europe at this point. That's all. Those are still really the only two games in town, okay? And the Lutheran Church is really small. It really only exists in Germany. And then Luther is able to get a number of people involved, most notably and famously in Scandinavia. Um... Because <clears throat> Luther basically makes the argument that, hey, if you don't have a pope to pay to, then that's 25% of your income that, like, you know, the church owned and stuff like that, and your tithe, which was 10% and stuff like that, and you're just going to get a lot more money if you don't have to pay all that in. And to be honest, money, not religion, really rules the day. Um, and the Lutheran church is able to solidify itself by the mid-16th century or so as a different thing, as a separate entity. Now, at the same time, Calvin, okay? is messing around in Switzerland. Actually, it's Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin. And he's going to break off, and he's going to form a different branch of Christianity, separate from Catholicism and separate from Lutheranism here. Okay? Okay, it's going to be Calvinism, and then I'll talk about what that means and what it does in a bit, but let me explain this first. Now that that's happened, you now have an umbrella term known as Protestants. Okay? Lutherans are a branch of Protestants. Calvins are a branch of Protestants. All Lutherans are Protestants, not all Protestants are Lutheran, okay? Same type of thing here. And what you see now, you look at this graph, is in bold, those are the overarching things, like Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, Protestant. We're going to add a lot to Protestant here in a second, okay? And then Lutheran is like one of the, is, there are five um, mainline Protestant denominations, and Lutheran is one of those. Calvinism is going to morph them into something. So when you see it in italics, that's what that means there. Um, but all of these represent an overarching umbrella term that is anything against, like, a protest that's not Eastern Orthodox, not Catholic, is at this point Protestant, okay? Now, Protestants, as you change and strip down things significantly, this is part of the Protestant Church and part of the arguments of the Protestant Church is that you need to get rid of the trappings of the Catholic Church. And you can see, while still grandiose to a certain extent, they're nowhere near as ornate. Protestants get rid of saints. Protestants get rid of some of the um, sacraments. Luther, for example, saw evidence of two sacraments in the Bible. He saw evidence of baptism. He saw evidence of uh, communion or the Eucharist. And he said, you know, everything else is kind of made up. Eventually, they also settled on... Um, <clears throat> confirmation and uh, marriage as well. Um, but Protestants, uh, the idea is to uh, get rid of that down, is to kind of um, strip that down some. Now, um, um, the idea behind this um, was um, Luther wanted to strip this down. Calvin wanted to reinterpret a couple of things. And Calvin's going to go back to this dude by the name of Augustine of Hippo from the 400s in the patristic era. And Calvin is going to say, you know, there are two really key ideas that I'm going to add in here that Augustine brought up before. The first one is this idea of original sin, okay? And this basically argues that because we're all descended from Adam and Eve, and because Adam and Eve and all are, were sinners because they ate, the gar uh, uh, they ate the apple in the garden, therefore we are all born with original sin, and therefore we are all sinners, and therefore we all must like earn God's love, etc., etc. This is the exact opposite of what Luther saw, um, and one of the key things that separated these early, early denominations here. This is important to understand both in Christian history or Christianity, Christian history, but also in European literature and Western literature and stuff like that. The other idea that Calvin brings forth here is he logics out this argument for predestination, which says that um, before you're even born, God has decided he has predetermined whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. Um, this is not free will. This is the one part um, separating um Christianity and, uh, or sorry, the one branch of Christianity, or not one, but the main one, um, separating Christianity from other branches of Christianity and Judaism. And it believes that God has predetermined things, that 10% of us are involved, are going to heaven, 90% of us are going to hell. Um, and this is what led to, um, as you can see, 
um, as you can see, um, this is what led to the like um, Southern Baptist and Hellfire and Brimstone and Puritans and Pilgrims, and we're not going to dance or do anything along those lines or anything fun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, coincidentally, um, somebody pointed out they were like, you know, you know, as long as um, you know, things are predetermined and God's already decided and stuff like that. Um, why don't we do whatever the heck we want? This is actually known as antinomianism, and this is how the state of Rhode Island was founded. You know, we might as well just go do whatever the heck we want, go murder, go kill, go have fun, go drink, blah, 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 blah. Um, everybody said, no, that's ridiculous, and the few people that disagreed, they moved from the Massachusetts Bay Colony over, and bam, they founded the state of Rhode Island, stuff like that. Um, coincidentally, you know, Calvin says that you've got um, about 10% uh, uh, of the elect, so um, you guys can sit there and figure out at home who's going to join me in heaven because I'm clearly there, and that's about it. Not the rosiest version of Christianity, and that is why, and this is really important to know, Presbyterians today and Baptists do not buy into this, okay? There are some groups, like smaller groups, that might, and the ones that you see that are just written not in italics and stuff like that, those are non-mainline um Protestant denominations, but Presbyterians and Southern Baptists, which both grow out of this, are not currently buying into the idea of predestination. Original sin is kind of Calvin's like um, big D idea, and you should know what predestination is in that theory, um, but that's not something that's really overly popular within Christianity today. Um, split in the church. Really very simply, okay, this split is based in and around Henry VIII's inability to have legal sex with Anne Boleyn, okay? I wish I could say it was about more than that. Um, you could read all these books about the Tudor Revolution and government and all the changes that are made, but but to be honest, this is really about Henry, it's about Anne, and uh, if historians look at it any other way, they're, they're actually being very short-sighted on this thing. Um, if you remember the story, Henry, with all his wives, um, wanted to get a divorce, the Pope wouldn't give it to him. The story sometimes says that's because the Popes didn't grant divorces. That's not true. Um, popes did grant annulments all the time. The reason that the Pope wouldn't give Henry an annulment is because Henry's wife's nephew was their Holy Roman Emperor, and he had ridden down into Rome, and he was holding the Pope hostage. And so he, when this letter came, he was not going to embarrass his aunt and give her a divorce. And so as a result, Henry had two choices, listen to the Pope. Um, and hear the word no, which he'd never heard before in his life, which means he wouldn't be able to have legal sex and have a male heir and supposedly with Anne Boleyn and stuff like that, or a break away from the church. And um, original um, Anglicanism, which is what this is, and it's known as the Anglican Church um, when you're in um, the United Kingdom in Europe, and it's known as the Episcopalian Church when you're in the United States and Canada. Those are exactly the same thing, have the same leader, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, the main thing originally um, was very similar to um, Catholicism. Eventually it spread out, got rid of some saints and stuff along those lines. Um, parts Canon Episcopalian Church also um, drifted off from time to time. You're going to have um, some arguments about over how rigid it could be, which is going to lead to the Methodist um, denomination right there, um, which will come out in the um, 18th century or so under John Wesley. Um, and then you're also going to have some smaller denominations, most of which grow out of like this form of like Catholicism here. And that makes, or not Catholicism, sorry, Anglicanism here or Episcopalianism here or something along those lines. And those make up the vast, vast, vast majority of Protestants right there in a massive oversimplification. This next slide is going to um, just show you some pictures of what some non-mainline Protestant churches look like. Um, as I said, there are five mainline Protestants today, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Anglican, Methodist, and Baptist. Non-mainline Protestants can vary from very moderate most people associate non-mainland Protestant with super conservative. That's not always true. You get very, very liberal non-mainland Protestant churches like Congregationalist churches or Unitarian churches. Unitarians even say, hey, just come worship with us. It doesn't matter whether you believe in Jesus, stuff along those lines. Um, and actually, it was in about 2010, um, for the first time in the United States history, that the number of mainline Protestants, or sorry, that the number of non-mainline Protestants passed the number of mainline Protestants on the U.S. Census registration for the first time. The last group we need to add in here um, actually goes outside the Protestant box, even though they're the newest, and that would be the Mormon Church. And I'm not going to go into the history of um, the Church of, um, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormonism or stuff like that now. That is for um, another project, another later, and we will take questions and we'll do answers and stuff like that along those lines. But suffice to say that um, Mormons um, see themselves as having um, taken the ideas from Jesus of Nazareth to um, Paul, but not really been corrupted, and through Paul and his disciples, but not really being corrupted by the Council of Nicaea and stuff along those lines. Instead, they see their teachings as having come out from that, and also adding the Book of Mormon, and that's really how you get kind of the Mormon church. One thing that's important to note that like comes up a lot is Mormons do not consider, th wait, well, first of all, Mormons are absolutely Christian. 
the way to salvation is through Jesus of Nazareth. That needs to be said. A lot of people think Mormons are not Christian. They are. But Mormons do not consider themselves Protestant. And that's why in the end I talk about four main, like, different um, branches of Christianity here. You can see the outside of some Mormon churches or temples here. Sorry, not churches. Um, the big ones are temples. Um, we'll talk about how these works, um, but you're not actually allowed to go inside um, without a temple recommend card and be a member of a church and, and, and communion and stuff along those lines. Um, but they are the very grandiose structures, and a lot of you guys have probably seen um, the one in Bellevue um, that kind of towers over everything else. There is a 15-minute uh, and change breakdown of like the division of Christianity. Um, everything up right there. Things in bold, remember, are your four main branches, Catholic, Mormon, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant. Once you get into the Protestant box, the things in italics are your mainline Protestant, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Itali Itali uh, Anglican, Episcopalian, those are the same thing, Methodist and Baptist. And then the other ones are just some examples, though there are thousands and thousands and thousands of non-mainline Protestant ones. Your job now is to think about this, think about which one might interest you, because next week we're going to spend some time looking at Protestant denominations. Have a good one, y'all. See you guys soon.